Hi, my name is Matt Holliday and welcome back to my class on Programming in Go. In this segment I'm going to talk about Go modules. What they are, how to use them, uh, really at the day-to-day -day level. What you need to do as a day-to-day -day developer. All right, and I'll explain a little bit about how that works. Go modules were invented to handle the dependency management problem. And what is that? Well, we have a program that doesn't just use our software, it uses third-party libraries. And these days, pretty much, they're all open source. They're found out on places like GitHub. Now, in the past, what you might have done is downloaded those repos, like cloned the repos, built some stuff, moved it around, and then that turned out not to work very well, right? And there are various people who have done dependency management in other languages. If you're a Java user, you've probably seen Maven. And of course, JavaScript has NPM. I'll talk more about that in a second, right? And what they attempt to do is help you identify, okay, what does your program need? Get it, get the right version, and deal with some issues. Now, there's some limitations here. One of which is, how do you make sure that the thing is still available if you need it? and it's the right version, and it's a safe version. And this is a problem that's popped up in the JavaScript world a few years ago, something called LeftPad. It was a small package, and I think it was 11 lines of JavaScript, and the author took it down, and suddenly it disappeared, and large numbers of people couldn't run their JavaScript programs because it was suddenly not available, right? And you think, you know, in the cloud, you start a container and, and you know, a new instance of a cloud thing, and suddenly this thing's just not available to download. And if you can't download it, if you didn't already have it on your disk, that's a problem. Now, there is an approach called vendoring, okay, and Go supports that, and it, people, some people do that, where you basically get all the things you need, you copy them into your repo along with your own project, and you version control the whole thing. That works. Um, it can get rather large, particularly in the case of no, node modules, all right? And that's, you know, not a solution that works for everybody. So the goal of Go modules is to provide dependency management that works as well as vendoring without the need to actually do vendoring. And that's a pretty good achievement. So this slide has a laundry list of things, right? I want to call out a couple of them. One is that dependencies are available and secure. Okay, obviously if you vendor stuff, then it's available. It's in your repo all the time. And you don't want to have the situation where, okay, I need to use something, I go out on the internet, it's not there because somebody moved his GitHub repo or renamed it or whatever. So the Git system, excuse me, not the Git system, the Go system, which they actually use Git, um, is going to try to make sure that those modules, once you've used them, are always available by having a proxy server that stores them, and it stores them in a way that keeps them secure. Nobody can slip in a different version with the same name that's not secure and hack your application that way. All right, so that's a pretty powerful thing. Um, and there's some, I'll mention a couple of talks later that get into it in detail. The other thing we want is for it to work well with the Go ecosystem. And we're getting there, all right? Um, we're in Go 115, I, right now as I write this, we're doing Go 115, 116 is around the corner. And at that point, I think it's pretty much done and everything just works, all right? And that's quite an achievement. Now, you know, what about dependencies? There's a bigger problem we gotta think about. And I just wanna get into that for a minute. You could call it the philosophy of dependencies if you want to. Uh, what I've noticed lately is some folks advertising their open source packages on, say, tweet with Twitter. And you see a tweet that says, hey, you know, my package is neat and it has minimal dependencies. That's an advertising slogan now, if you will. All right, so dependencies are a risk, and Go modules and the Go proxy server is an attempt to remove certain risks, like the package goes away or somebody replaces it with a hacked version to try to hack your program. What it's never going to fix is, well, what about the original software that was made available as a third-party package? Is it any good? Is it secure? All right, and the only thing I can do is offer you the Latin phrase, caveat emptor which means let the buyer beware. If you're going to use a third-party dependency, then you may want to ask questions like, is it being maintained? Is it secure? Is it being tested? You know, is this a safe thing to put in your project? Okay. 
Now, there's a couple of papers, right? The original one is Ken Thompson, and if you don't know who he is, he's the guy who invented Unix. And almost 40 years ago, he got a Turing Award, and he gave a speech, and it was this paper, right? Reflections on Trusting Trust, and it's all about third-party dependencies. Who are you going to trust? So fast forward 40 years, and Russ Cox on the Go team has written another similar paper, you can find it, all right, about dependencies. Because dependencies are a risk, and lots of dependencies are not a good thing. Left pad is the canonical example. And so we have this Go proverb on here, right? A little copying is better than a little dependency. Sometimes copying and pasting is the better choice. Okay, And I'm going to expand on that and say a little dependency is definitely better than a big, messy dependency. All right, But I'm going to let you make your own judgment calls about what you depend on. Okay, so there is an issue about package compatibility and versioning. I don't want to get into it very much, okay? But we have the notion of semantic versioning, where if your major number changes, well, then that's a new incompatible package, right? And we need to be able to import the old and the new, probably, or at least we may need to be able to do that as people make transitions. And so by giving it a different path, as shown on this slide, it's possible to import the original one or the v2 one or the v3 one or whatever, okay? Now, how does it work? Well, we've got a couple of files, very important files, that are part of your project. Go.mod and go.sum. Okay? Go.mod is a recording of your module name and your direct dependencies, or almost always your direct dependencies. Every once in a while you'll see something in there that with a little tag after it says indirect. But generally speaking, it's the direct dependencies, the things that you use in your code by import statements. Go.sum is a, check, a big database of checksums about the things you use, not just directly, but indirectly. Okay, You need to make sure you add them and commit them with your other code. Otherwise, it defeats the whole purpose of using Go modules. Okay, So you'll see a kind of example. If you, bait, if you just went out and created a new go.mod file, right, you'd see something like what's on this slide. right? Uh, it should say go 115 now or something. And if you look at go.sum, it's got a bunch of entries with checksum data. It's not very readable, and you don't really need to read it. So there's some environment variables you need, may need to set in your environment about how Go modules works. It may be you can just use the defaults. Okay? The first two of these, Go proxy is basically a direction of, well, where to go find the proxy server. Now, a few people run a private proxy, and if you need to use one of those, like you work in a corporate environment and they want you to go through a corporate proxy, well, then you would add it here. Okay, uh, the sum database, yeah, probably you're just going to continue using the one that Go provides. If you have private modules, again, you're working in a corporate environment, so you maybe have some private modules that are in private GitHub repos. Well, you also have to set up to make sure you can get them. In other words, when you're going to build, you have to be able to download them, which means you have to be logged in in a way that you have the credentials to get them off of GitHub. But you may also need to say, hey, don't go through the proxy to get these, or don't worry about the sum, the checksum database. They won't be there because they're private. And so you may need to set these go private and go no sum DB. Right. Okay, I said I was going to talk about how they work. Right. So your code imports things. The things you import end up in go.mod, and then go.sum has a reflection of checksums for the things you import and the things they depend on. Because in the end, to build your program, all the direct imports have to be downloaded and then all the things they need, right? It's the transitive closure of all your dependencies will have to be fetched from wherever, brought onto your machine to build your software. And at this point, Go modules is purely source-based. There are no more binary modules where somebody has something pre-compiled, right? So effectively, either it's open source or it's private to your company. Now. Out there in the, in the world outside of your system, your laptop, is the proxy server and the sum database. Okay? And Go is going to go and look at the proxy server to find out what versions are available and get them. And it's going to use the sum database to compare your local go.sum checksum file with the actual checksums of real packages. And it's pretty neat how it works. It's very secure. There's a presentation that Katie Hockman did two or three years ago at GopherCon. I recommend it. It gets into some of the details of how this stuff works. It's a little complicated, 
pretty neat and very secure. All right, so if you drill down into go.mod, there's a few details you may want to look at. One of which is um, some of these things are going to show versions, right? So we see cloud.google.com slash go version 0 0.35.1. Okay, well, that's based on a tag that somebody put into their Git repo. But if we look right after it, the very next thing is this Gen 2 brain slash Malgo, and that is a pseudo version. So there's no, it was, it was taken, say, off of somebody's, you know, trunk out of the repo without a tag. Okay, so it wasn't a release version from the point of view of Git or GitHub. And so it generates a pseudo version that looks like this, right? Which is basically, you know, a date and a commit hash. And the, the version number is this 000 thing. So you'll see a few of those, okay? But most of the time you'll see, you know, people go and get release versions that have been tagged for release. Now, the other thing you may see is a replace. Uh, I remember, and this is something that actually happened to me, a particular time a bug was found in the release version, and for a while until there was a new release, right, you put a replace directive in to say, hey, instead of getting 120, go and get, you know, this other commit off of, say, the trunk. And that's going to be the one I want to use in place of the one that's broken. Okay, so there's a way to do replace. Um, there's some other people working about things like, well, if I'm building locally and I want a temporary version of something, um, I don't know if Replace does that right now, but that's being looked at. Okay, so what do you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, when you start a new project, you're going to do go mod init, and you're going to have a module name. Now, in most cases, if you're committing stuff to, say, a place like GitHub, then your module name is going to be, you know, the, the repo name or something like that, right? And then you're going to do go build. Well, this is true up through 1.15 today. If you do go build, it's going to go and download or go get whatever it needs to build your program. Okay, that's going to change in 1.16. In 1.16, the normal model for go build is to treat go.mod as read only. All right, and then you'll be forced to actually do your own go gets to get the things you need. Right. Well, every once in a while you realize, hey, you know, I've been using the same versions of things for a while, and it's time for me to do some updates, all right? Um, maybe you have Dependabot and it's telling you you should update, or maybe you just realize, hey, there's a point where, you know, I've got a sprint where we can just focus on doing the updates and dealing with any issues they cause. Because if you've been on somebody's package for a year and you upgrade, you just never know, right? It might be a little different, or it might behave differently. It might expose a bug right? Or it might even have a new bug of its own, right? So to get everything updated, you can do a go get dash u on your whole project. And that will just basically go back through the imports, find the current most recent versions of things, and update your go.mod. And if you do that, you're going to want to do a go mod tidy, which is a cleanup thing. It will make sure that things that need to be removed from your go.mod get removed, right? So I would normally do these two things together when I decide it's time to update a package. Right? Now, you don't have to update everything. And oh, by the way, and I don't know how many times I need to say this, you know, always make sure you're, up, you're committing go.mod and go.sum with your other changes. Okay, so if you want to find the versions of something, there's a go list command that can do that. It'll go out and say, hey, these are the different versions of this package or at least help you find what's the most recent. And you can actually update a single dependency by going and getting that one dependency at a certain version. And there's several different ways to say it. The most common one, you know, is either latest, whatever the latest released is, or a particular release by version number, the tag. But there are other ways to do it, including commits and, you know, in certain cases, like if you just go and get a branch name, okay, that's gonna be a non-release and you should see like a pseudo version number, okay? Um, normally, I just go out there and find, you know, what's the latest tagged version, because in theory, that's something that's been released and is ready to use and use it, okay? Again, commit go.mod and go.sum. All right, now you can still vendor. That works, okay? There's a command go mod vendor, and here's an interesting detail. If you're building for Google's App Engine, 
and you're using Go modules, it's weird. And this is a situation that arises for us at my company because we have some private stuff. So we're a combination of open source and private modules. And what we actually have to do is, in order to build in Google's App Engine, is run Go Mod Vendor and then hide the Go.mod and Go.sum files before we tell you know, G Cloud to deploy our App Engine app. All right. So we actually do vendoring as part of the build process, even though we don't normally vendor in order to commit to our repo. But you could. Right. Um, up through Go.113, if you're building in the vendored mode, you have to say mod equals vendor. That went away. So I don't think you need to worry about that anymore. Okay. Right. If you look at GoPath, and so part of modules is you don't have to have your GoPath set and have all your projects under GoPath. Okay. But if you don't set GoPath, Go will still pick a place and put some things there, right? And one of the things they put there is the module cache of all the stuff that you've downloaded onto your, say, laptop to build various projects. It's all kept there, okay? You can clean it, right, if you need to. If there's a reason for you to just empty it out because you're worried that something's gotten screwed up, you can clean it out and just go back to the beginning. Of course, you'll now need to do Go Gets to go get all that stuff that you don't have anymore in order to build your software. Now, there's a huge chunk of information out there, okay? I have not tried to cover it all. If you're somebody providing a module, let's say you're building a package that you want to provide as an open source third-party package, you may need to know a little bit more about modules, right? If you run into problems, you may need to know a little bit more about modules, okay? There's a huge wiki page about it, and there's just no way in this presentation I'm going to go into all the details. All I've tried to do is tell you sort of the things you need to know as a day-to-day -day developer, right? I want to build my program and use some third-party stuff and just make sure I've got the right stuff in it, okay? If you need to know more, well, then start reading. Okay, so that's my quick introduction to Go modules. Again, what I'm trying to do is tell you what to need to know on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, to make a program and get download stuff and deal with upgrading dependencies and stuff like that. Okay, I think Go Modules is the go-to way of doing dependency management in Go now, and it just works, and it's pretty much done. I think there's one tweak coming in 1.16, but at this point, it's kind of a done deal, and like I say, it's pretty stable. I think it's head and shoulders above what you're going to see in some other languages.